Although everyone has heard of the Syrian civil war, far fewer actually know what's going on. The situation is very complicated and so a lot of people tend to just ignore it. But although a civil war in name, the situation in Syria really is an international issue, with the conflicting aims of all involved leading to a confusing yet devastating 10 years for the country. It begins, like many civil wars, with tension rising between a president and his people. Assad had grown unpopular because of his increasingly authoritarian regime and the deepening socio-economic divisions in Syria. This led to peaceful protests all over the country in what was called the Arab Spring in 2011, where many Middle Eastern countries protested against their governments. As the involvement of the military increased, the protests escalated until the rebellion had grown into a civil war. The main division in the war was regime versus rebels, but there's also a politically important religious divide, with the regime being Shia but the rebels being Sunni. Shia and Sunni are two different forms of Islam which have long divided the Middle East, with the main Shia countries being Iran and Iraq, and the main Sunni countries being Saudi Arabia and Turkey. Although Shia Muslims make up a far smaller proportion of the population in Syria, the regime was strengthened by its centralised control in the military. The rebels, on the other hand, were far more disconnected. So the main rebel coalitions include the Free Syrian Army, formed by military defectors in 2011, and all the groups within the National Coalition, which acts as a leadership council. These groups make up the majority of rebels, and their general aim is to form a less authoritarian government. There are also religious extremists, including al-Nusra, al-Qaeda and ISIS. These groups are prepared to take more brutal measures, like suicide bombing, to carry out their aim of creating an Islamic state. The Kurds are Syria's largest ethnic minority. They are mainly represented by the Democratic Unity Party and have long suffered discrimination from the regime. Their aim is to gain political autonomy. The war becomes even more complicated when it becomes international. So intervening for Assad, there's Russia. As Syria is Russia's main ally in the Middle East, they are keen not to lose them and so have supplied weapons to the Syrian military, launched airstrikes against rebels from 2015 and repeatedly blocked UN resolutions criticising Assad. Then there's Iran, a long-standing ally of Syria and a Shia country. They are believed to be spending billions of dollars a year to prop up Assad, providing weapons, lines of credit and oil transfers. The USA became involved with airstrikes against ISIS as they rapidly expanded around 2014. They also provide limited military assistance to moderate rebels. Some even claim that their involvement has only been to claim the oil in Syria. The UK initially resisted involvement, voting against airstrikes in 2014, but committed joint airstrikes in 2018 against ISIS and committed military for counter-ISIS operations. Saudi Arabia is a sunny country and opposes the Shia regime in Syria. They supplied rebel groups with weapons and funds. Turkey has always been critical of Assad and their air bases have been used for airstrikes against ISIS. However, they are also fighting the Kurds, who they view as a terrorist group, and so have invaded Kurdish territory in northern Syria. This leaves us with a complicated division of aims. In Syria, the majority of rebels want to overthrow the government, whilst the regime wants to crush this rebellion, and Iran and Russia share this aim. But on the side of the rebels, although Saudi Arabia and Turkey share the rebels' main aim, the US and UK are more focused on getting rid of ISIS. Considering that the extremist rebels want an Islamic state, and Turkey is trying to crush the Kurds, whilst the Kurds are trying to gain political autonomy, it is clear that the rebels are very divided, whereas the regime have the advantage that its allies share its one central aim. So the question is, which of these aims have been achieved, and where are we now? The US and UK's aim to defeat extremism has been quite successful. At its height, ISIS controlled nearly a third of Syria, but since then, airstrikes and military have essentially eradicated their presence. As a result, the US have pulled its troops out of Syria, declaring the war against ISIS to be over. Looking at the internal conflict between the regime and the rebels, at the moment Assad is decisively winning, largely due to the support given by Iran and Russia. The last remaining rebel territory is Idlib, which is currently controlled by Turkey and Russia. The Kurds have gained a sizable portion of northeastern territory, which is self-governing. However, with Turkey committing bombing campaigns as recently as last year, it is clear that the Turkish-Kurdish conflict is not over yet. Due to coronavirus, a ceasefire has been agreed in Idlib, and for now the fighting is at a standstill. Some even claim the war is over, and Assad has won. But although the war seems to be ending, the effects on Syria will be long-lasting. Syria has not always been a poor country. The economy experienced strong growth throughout the 1990s. It is the economic sanctions imposed by many countries over the war which has had a devastating effect on the economy. The war has also killed an estimated half a million people, with around 12 million being displaced or fleeing the country, contributing largely to the refugee crisis. 
putting much of daily life to a standstill, the lack of access to healthcare, housing and education has pushed millions into poverty, with about 2 million children out of school as of 2019. With the sad currently focusing on punishing former rebel communities and keeping those same economic aims which had already led to large wealth disparity, he seems to be deepening the same divisions that arguably caused the initial uprisings, signalling to many that the struggle between him and his people is not over yet. Economically, the country faces the costs of rebuilding, which range from $250 billion to $400 billion in early 2019, yet the Syrian government have only allocated $115 million for the reconstruction. Any foreign financing for reconstruction is uncertain, with Iran and Russia facing economic problems of their own and other countries unwilling to offer assistance until a clear political solution is reached. The road to recovery looks long and hard, with Syria facing the aftermath of both physical and economic destruction, as well as the regime's punishment of former rebel communities. But the civil war is close to us as well, from the UK committing airstrikes that have added to the destruction, to the refugee crisis many complain about without thinking about the situations that have been left behind. We should not be ignoring the Syrian civil war. The least we can do is show compassion and understanding, which begins with educating ourselves on the conflict.